All righty. Good morning, all. Uh, this is Wednesday, uh, January 27th. Uh, we have made it through uh, our second week of class. I know the first week barely felt like one because we only had one day. Uh, we're going to continue our exploration of the cardiovascular system, uh, talking about physiology and anatomy and things along those lines. Uh, you have a handful of assignments coming up as we rapidly approach our exams. There's a handout on your interactive physiology that is due Monday that is going to be graded for correctness. So make sure you do that correctly, read it carefully, answer it correctly. Also, your first physio X is due. Remember, we're doing exercise six first. There are two on the cardiovascular system. So two, uh, we're doing six first. It has five different activities. So remember, you find that in the study area of your master in a &P. You're going to do all the activities, save all of it to your lab report, save the lab report as a PDF and submit that online. Uh, and so you'll have five lab reports. Uh, Wednesday, your physio X exercise five is due and that has seven activities, so seven lab reports. So the nice thing is we're not turning these into class so you don't have to kill a small tree to print all these things out. Just save them as PDFs and submit them online. In fact, uh, when we get back on campus, I think I may continue to do it that way just to save on paper. Also on Wednesday, your unit 18 review is due. Remember that is graded for completeness, but your cardiovascular exercise is due. And that is also gonna be graded for correctness. So make sure you're putting time and effort into that as you're learning your blood vessels. Uh, Monday, we will be talking about uh, blood, the last part of the cardiovascular system. And so to help us with that, uh, you've got your unit 19 review that's gonna be due, your physio X exercise 11, uh, just activity four, which has to do with blood typing is due. And then your labster uh, uh, hematology uh, assignment is due. And remember for uh, full credit on those, you need 100% complete and 80% correct. Uh, as a reminder, I believe you guys turned in a, have you, is this your first lapster? This is, no, this isn't your first lapster. Your first lapster was due today. Uh, again, remember the lapster is connected directly to Canvas. So when you complete that activity, it automatically puts in your grade. It puts it in your lapster dashboard, but it also puts it in your grade. And if you get 90% correct, then it's going to input it as 18 points. But remember, to get uh, full credit, you just need 80% correct. So I have to manually go in and change the grade. So now that it was due today, after today, I will typically go in and upgrade them. So uh, again, you will see, uh, you may see a, a grade, a partial score on your grade, but as long as you got it 100% complete and 80% correct, you will get full credit for that. So uh, don't worry about that. Those grades will be changed. It's just because it's linked to Canvas that they do that. Most of the things we have are linked to Canvas. The Physio X is the only thing that's not linked to Canvas. I wish it was because uh, that would be easier to submit those lab reports that way as well, but it isn't. Uh, all of that leads up to our Wednesday, the 10th lab exam. That also reminds you that, again, the weekend of the 6th and 7th is your last weekend to study for this exam. Again, the exam must be completed during class time. Uh, both exams are timed exams, so let's use simple numbers. Let's say that the lecture exam is two hours, and the lab exam is one hour. Obviously, you have four and a half hours of class to complete those in, so you have time to uh, take a break in between, for instance. You don't have to start right at eight o'clock if you want to sleep in a little bit on those days. However, it must be completed during lab time. If you start the lab exam at noon, Right, you're only getting 35 minutes to complete that because it must be completed during the class time. It's just like if we were taking this in the class. So 12.35 ends, our class has to leave the room and the next class has to come in. So that's how it's gonna be on this as well. Also from previous experience over the past couple uh, classes, I can tell you that uh, most people, when they have some type of technical issues with the exam, it is on the lab exam. The lab exam, especially this one, is probably gonna be something close to 80 to 90 questions and they're all images and they all have to load at the same time. So sometimes people have internet or connectivity or it freezes, all those types of issues. So it is better to start early so that you can resolve those issues ahead of time. Uh, so, and, uh, and we can try to fix those as, as well during that time. So I encourage you to do the lab exam first, but it's not required. You may take the tests in any order that you like. Just make sure you complete them during the class time. Obviously, we are just doing the exams on that day. There is no lecture on that day, but I will be available by email. But honestly, if you're having technical issues, I shouldn't be the one you're reaching out to. If you get kicked out of an exam for some reason or something along those lines, you should be able to get back into it. 
or you should be able to reconnect. However, I will warn you that the timer continues to go. So if you lose internet, don't go and make a cup of coffee or take a Starbucks run and then come back yeah, half an hour later because a half an hour of your time on that exam is gonna be gone when you come back to it. If you are not able to get back in, Proctorio's tech support is excellent at helping those who need help and assistance getting back in. I am not capable of putting you back into the exams. Only Proctorio is capable of doing that. So if you have issues, contact them. It's okay to let me know with while they're resolving it if you want. You don't have to even, uh, but you can if you want, but I can't do much about it. They're the ones that can help to get you back into those exams. All right, questions on any of that? Excellent. Nothing I love more than 8.15 in the morning than a stunned silence. Perfect. Excellent. So you've all mastered it. So good. That means also I can make the test harder because you guys are all doing so well and so competent. All right. Spectacular. Let's dive back into the material then. So we left off last class. And we were talking about the um, movement of electrical activity that takes place in the heart, uh, driven and directed by our cardiac conduction system. And as we talked about at the end of the last class, we can actually measure this change in electrical activity of the cells uh, using a machine called an electrocardiogram. So this records the electrical signals of the cardiac conduction system. Primarily, it measures two things. It measures the, change in the changes in membrane potential and the movement of the electrical signal. So what it is really measuring is changes the change in the membrane potential and the movement of that electrical signal, all right? Now, when we do this, and I think this will help us to understand, there are three main uh, deflections or formations that are caused in this. The first is the P wave. Whoops, hold on. This P wave, and actually let's do it this way. I like this better. Oops. Let's switch back to the whiteboard and draw this. So the first major deflection is what is known as the P wave. Now, when we talk about the P wave, what is the P wave measure? What is it actually a measurement of? Atrial depolarization. Excellent. It is a measure of the change in the membrane potentials that is spreading across the atria, right? Notice if we were to look at this, we've got a flat line and then we have this bump, this deflection that occurs and then it goes straight again. Now, let's think about this. At this point right here, what percentage of the cells of the atria are depolarized? Here, maybe it'll be Zero? easier if we do this. Yeah, exactly. There, is that easier? Zero. Zero percent depolarized at this point. No, that's way too big. Let's make that smaller. So zero de depolarized at this point. All right. What percentage is depolarized at this flat point? Two. How much? A hundred. Okay, zero. I've heard both answers. I've heard zero and I've heard a hundred, and I've heard them both in enthusiastically. Which is it? A hundred. A hundred. Zero. hundred. Absolutely. Nope. It is 100% depolarized. Remember, 
these deflections are not a measure of the membrane potential. They are a measure of movement and change. This curve, if you think about it, at this part right here, three cells of the atria are uh, depolarizing, are changing their potential. And then 10 R, and then 50 R, and then 100 R. But then if you think about it, it reaches a point where most of the cells of the atria are depolarized. So fewer cells change. So only 40 cells are left to change. And then only 20 cells are left to change. And then only two cells are left to change until finally we reach a point where all of the cells are in their depolarized state. There is no more movement of electrical activity. There is no more change. The cells themselves have changed state from being at rest to being excited and depolarized, but that's not what we're measuring. We're not measuring membrane potential. We are measuring change. We are measuring movement. And so when we reach this flat part, there is no more change. There is no more movement. All right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Excellent. What's the next deflection? Q wave. Well, true, it is, but really, you are absolutely right, it is the Q wave, but the Q tends to be lumped together with the QRS complex. You are absolutely correct that the next thing that happens is we get a small downward, oops, don't want it to be red, a small downward deflection that is known as the Q, uh, that then leads to a high major spike known as the R, and then it goes to another small downward deflection known as the S. So these three collectively are typically lumped together. The QRS complex. So what events are occurring during the QRX complex? A change. So we are measuring changes, absolutely. So what are some of the changes that we may be measuring? Ventricular depolarization. Excellent, ventricular depolarization. But shouldn't that just be another curve, round, smooth wave the same way that P was? Why do we have this weird, interesting looking, complicated complex of the QRS? Is there anything else happening during this time? As the wave is propagating through the AV node, you see that time lag because it has to move through, uh, I guess, more viscous fluid. Um, but then once it reaches a certain point, it's able to fully and rapidly propagate through the uh, ventricles so that's why you see that major spike in membrane potential because everything is depolarizing at once. And then as it flows through and away from the electrode, you get that negative spike. That is part of it. You are correct. Those are the events that is happening in the ventricle. But something else is happening at the same time. There you go. Laura's got it. At the same time that the ventricles are depolarizing, our atria are repolarizing. So we have the repolarization. Actually, let's be consistent. So we have atrial repolarization at the same time that the ventricles are depolarizing. So just as we talked about at this point, and we'll change colors just to emphasize it. At this point here, we have 100% depolarized atrial cells. What percentage of our ventricular cells are depolarized at this point? Zero. Zero. Yeah, zero percent. Uh, where's my, I lost it, there it is. Is 
0% depolarized ventricular cells. And after the QRS complex, we hit another flat part. And when we hit this flat part, what is the condition of those atrial and ventricular cells at this flat part? Fully depolarized. Which ones? Well, the ventricular cells are fully depolarized and the atrial cells should be fully repolarized and able to fire again soon. Excellent. So 0% depolarized atrial cells and 100% depolarized ventricular cells. which leads us to our third major deflection. And what's the third major deflection? T. T wave. And what is, the, what is left for us to measure as far as events go for the T wave? Repolarization ventricles. of ventricles. Of the ventricles, excellent. Or let's again be consistent. Ventricular repolarization. Excellent. So first a oops. first a couple cells start to repolarize, then a couple more, then a couple more, then a couple more, then a couple more, until most of them, and then there are fewer to repolarize, fewer to repolarize, fewer to repolarize, fewer to repolarize until. We hit our flat part again. And of course, just to be consistent with everything we've done so far at this point, of course, now 0% of the ventricular cells are uh, depolarized. So again, we are measuring movement. We are measuring change. We're not measuring voltage. We're not measuring mechanical activity. What we're measuring is movement and change in membrane potential. Notice if you think about it, both the P wave and the T wave are waves that deflect in the upward direction. But one, oops, hold on, I'll make that 14 again so that I can make my T big. But the P wave is when cells are depolarizing and the T wave is when cells are repolarizing. All right, so again, I've done an okay job of drawing this, but let's look at the pretty picture from your textbook. And again, these are our three general formations. However, as Daniel pointed out, there is a lot more information in this than we see. So we need to be able to look at and identify these stages and these steps. So as we talked about, the P wave is the spread of the depolarization from the SA node across the atria until we reach the point that all of the atria are completely depolarized. However, as we know, that depolarization does not continue to spread continuously to the ventricle. It gets directed to the ventricle by the AV node, by the bundle branches and by the bundle of Hiss. And so notice there is a brief flat period where there is no change. This happens to be known as the PQ uh, interval, uh, pardon me, PQ segment. And this PQ segment where there's no change is, as Daniel pointed out, the delay that is caused uh, by those thin, small, uh, slow moving, um, AV node cells. So we talked about how the AV node cells are small, they have a high resistance and they slow the spread of the electrical activity. And this PQ segment is the indication of that. Now, eventually it makes it through that 
And as it makes it through that, it travels down the bundle of hiss, down the bundle branches, and reaches the apex of the heart. And that cue deflection is actually when the electrical activity reaches the apex of the heart and starts to spread along the ventricles. So as it reaches the uh, apex, we hit the cue, and then two uh, independent events are occurring. We have the spread of the electrical signal up the Purkinje fibers, depolarizing the ventricle. I'll tell you that in a second, Laura. And at the same time, we have the repolarization of the atria. Well, great question. I was going to mention this in a second, but since you brought it up now, this is a perfect time to include it. The big difference between a segment and an interval, and this is how I always remember it, intervals include the deflections, whereas the segments are between the deflections. So here, here would be the PQ interval, whereas, as I mentioned, the flat part is the PQ segment. Segments do not include the deflections, intervals uh, do. Intervals include. So Thank they're you. not interchangeable. Which is a great question, because if I asked you to identify the PQ segment and the PQ interval, and tell me what is occurring during them and why they're significant, very different answers. Which I'm pretty sure is part of the ECG homework that you guys have, All right? Excellent. So that QRS complex, two major movements are taking place. The repolarization of the atrial cells, the depolarization of the ventricular cells, and then we reach the ST in a segment. With the ST segment, again, it's a flat part where there is no change going on. All of the cells of the ventricle are depolarized. All of the cells of the atria are back at rest. And then as the ventricles repolarize, we measure that movement, we measure that change with our T interval. Until we reach the next flat part. And at that flat point, the entire heart is at rest. At which point, of course, our sinoatrial node will fire another action potential and the whole thing happens again. All right. Well, sir, I don't know if I'm getting ahead, but we're we gonna go over like ST elevations and what that is exactly. Um, so kind we're gonna curious. talk, we're gonna talk about intervals and segments. We're not gonna talk too much about the amplitude and the implication of that. Although the amplitude basically is a measurement of the size of the change that is taking place. But we will talk about intervals and segments. And so actually let's do that. Since you guys have asked a couple questions about it, let's actually go back to the whiteboard and, and see if we can infer some information. All right, so as I mentioned before, there is a difference between the PQ uh, segment and the PQ interval. So I kind of already gave it to you, but I'll ask the question anyway. What is the significance of the PQ segment? What is that a measure of? The delay from the AV node. There you go. It's the measure of the delay from the AV node. Excellent. So then what would your definition or the significance of the PQ interval be? Why is that significant? Why is that measurement something that might be useful or important? How long it takes for the uh, atrial um, atrium to depolarize to the beginning of when 
the um, ventricles begin to depolarize. Absolutely. That's a great way of describing it. Absolutely. And again, if you think about it, it's really a measure. You're absolutely correct. And if you describe it that way on the exam, that would absolutely be correct. But another way to think of it, or, or, or a slightly different way to think of it, is it basically, because remember, uh, the Q is when that first signal reaches the apex. So if you think about it, the P is when the first cell of the atria uh, starts to excite. Two, as you pointed out, once we reach the Q, that is when the first cell of the ventricle begins to excite. So you're absolutely correct. So it's that measure of how long it's taking from the signal to, for the start of the atria to be excited to the start of the ventricle to be excited. Absolutely excellent. So again, and there's all sorts of important segments and intervals in here. But notice, and again, I want to beat that dead horse. This is a measure of movement and change. Is there an interval or a segment that indicates how long the atria is contracted for? The EKG doesn't measure contraction. Exactly. ECGs don't measure contractions, right? Now, we can infer, if we were to infer, and let's draw a black line for this, right? When would the atria start to contract? Just after it starts to depolarize? Yeah, somewhere around, somewhere, and let's actually use a fuzzy line for this, somewhere probably around here. Because we know when a cell depolarizes, remember there's a latent period before it starts to produce tension. But how many cells actually have to depolarize enough where we're producing enough tension in the atria to be measured? Do we know precisely where that point is, where this could go? No, but we know it's gotta be someplace after this and when does the contraction have to, of the atria have to stop? Somewhere within the to depolarize? Yeah, well, obviously enough have to depolarize. So, right, so again, we're, we're in this weird phase. So notice if we're somewhere in here, some of the cells of the atria technically are still depolarized but enough for it to be able to continue to contract. We know at this point, none of the cells are excited. They're all repolarized again. But as we know, when a cell repolarizes, is it necessarily gonna instantly go back to relaxation state? We know it takes time for the calcium. So maybe somewhere within this range, but notice we're totally guessing. And that's the point I'm trying to emphasize. This is not a measure of mechanical activity, right? We know that when the atria depolarize, they're going to contract. We know that when the atria relax, they're going to, I mean, uh, repolarize, they're going to relax. And the same thing for the ventricle, but this ECG doesn't measure those events. Okay, we comfortable with that idea? All right, excellent. So put it all together and we have the pretty picture here. Now, just because it doesn't give us the mechanical events that are taking place, it doesn't mean that it isn't important information. Like we just finished talking about, the PQ interval measures the beginning of the atrial excitation to the beginning of the ventricular excitation. However, notice in parentheses, I have PR interval there instead. Why might that be the case? Because intervals include deflections. True. But so then why, why would we use PR instead of PQ? Because the Q is a negative deflection. Oh, Not I like that. Okay, that's a good, that's a good thought. Okay. That could be one of the reasons. You're, you're, you're thinking of this to uh, you're thinking of this too critically. 
I want to think of it clinically. If you are a nurse staring at one of these ECGs, what's going to be easier to see, the Q deflection or the R deflection? The R, R is more obvious. R is way more obvious. And is it really that much of a difference in time between the Q and the R? No. So when you're measuring this interval, it is certainly much easier to go from P to R than it is to go from P to Q. And there's very little difference between them. So from a clinical standpoint, as you're a nurse, when you're doing this, most of the time they just measured as PR, just because there's so, we're talking about fractions of fractions of a second between Q and R there. So it's just easier. So when you're out in the real world, they tend to use PR instead of PQ. But the reason is because we want to go from the beginning of the atrial excitation to the beginning of the ventricular excitation. The ST segment is that second plateau stage. This is the part where the entire ventricle of the myocardium is excited. How long this segment is uh, may be an indication of the strength of the contraction. Again, is it going to be a precise measure of how long that contraction takes place for? No. But the longer the ST segment, typically, the more powerful the contraction, the longer, the more strenuous the contraction is as a result of that. So that can be an indication of the strength of it. You know, if the heart's beating faster, you can feel it beating in your chest as opposed to uh, just calmly sitting in there and things along those lines, right? QT interval beginning of the ventricular excitation all the way to the end. So basically when the first cell of the ventricle gets excited to when the last cell of the ventricle uh, repolarizes. So again, there's all these important intervals and segments. And again, remember intervals include the waves, uh, segments are in between them. And like I said, your ECG assignment uh, has you talking about uh, these activities. And of course, we can talk about the mechanical events that are related to them, but are not directly measured by them. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Now, of course, this is what hopefully a healthy heart, normal ECG reading of a heart is, but when there can be irregularities, like for instance, a fibrillation, if fibrillation is a very rapid, irregular contraction of the muscle fibers of the heart that result in a lack of synchronism. As we talked about, every single one of these cells is capable of firing action potentials. And what happens is they can get out of order where all of them are different firing at their different rates. When you talk to a cardiovascular surgeon, uh, when they look at this, it looks like they say the heart looks like it is a bag of worms just wiggling around because of this. Oh, I'm sorry, Ash, I didn't see. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was going to ask, do you know how like this all came about? Like, what is the history of this? Do they just have like a huge like amount of people to like volunteer for a lab and just kind of notice patterns? Or was it people who had problems first? Or like, how did this even start? Um, well, we definitely know that, uh, yeah, from, from the study of uh, frog legs and things along those lines, we have known from animal exploration how uh, different chemicals, different electrical stimuli and things like that are capable of uh, influencing the movement of the heart and, and, and muscle in that fashion. Um, and they, like I said, engineers use this technology to measure movement of electrical activities in the wall. And I'll be honest, I don't know what came first. I don't know if they started measuring the walls first. And they said, hey, this would work on a person as well. Or they worked on a person and say, hey, this would work on a house as well. But it's one way or the other. But yeah, it would just, we, we have from very early, again, and, and in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean when I was in grad school, right, or, uh, you know, in, in, in undergraduate in college, when we took a neuro class, one of the things that our instructor did, one of the things that I actually did, is that, like Daniel pointed out, they released frogs into the classroom, and every single one of us was responsible of collecting our own frog, and once you got your frog, you had to pith your frog. What it means to pith your frog is you hold the frog and find the base of its spinal cord, where the head meets the spinal cord. Then you take a very large gauge needle and you insert it into that and you push it down the vertebral column. And what that does is it destroys the spinal cord of the frog, but obviously doesn't kill the frog. So now the frog is paralyzed, but still alive. So that you can then pin him down to a board, 
you know, peel back the skin and the muscle, crack open the chest and see his still beating heart uh, while, and then be able to drop different chemicals and do other types of things to it to manipulate the activity of it. And so these are, you know, the types of experiments that have been going on for years. I know it sounds gruesome, Daniel, and that's why we have the physio X and stuff like that now. But um, as harsh as these things are, it is these types of things that allowed us to understand how the body works, how physiology works, right? I mean, there, there, there is an ancient history, you know, uh, Aristotle stole graves, I mean, stole bodies out of graves to study anatomy but you can't see function that way. And so uh, while animal research may be gruesome, we've gained a tremendous amount of information and understanding uh, by doing that type of research. But I promise you, anybody who ever did any kind of animal research that way, they all died horrible deaths very painfully and slowly. So they all got theirs, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I don't know. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I, it wouldn't surprise me if things like that occurred. Yeah, uh, for those of you, I haven't read it in a long time. Uh, do I even still have it? Uh, Mary Roach is an amazing uh, author who uh, I can't seem to find her book. Um, wrote a book called Stiff about um, about the study of death and things along those lines. They have an excellent, amazing book. I highly recommend it. I'm sure they talk, she talks about stuff in there. She's an amazing, very engaging author. Uh, when we get to the nerve, uh, the digestive system, she did an excellent book called Gulp. Uh, that one is really great. Uh, when we get to the reproductive system, uh, Bonk is a great book on uh, the study and the research involving uh, sex and the reproductive system. Yeah, she's a really amazing, really engaging author. I highly recommend her. All right. Excellent, the original crash chest dummies. That's awesome, Daniel. Excellent, so we have this heart wiggling like a worm. So how do we resolve that? Electricity. Right, exactly. Clear, boom, right? We give a big, huge electrical jolt. Why? Aside from it's fun watching the bodies jump off the table, why do we do that? To Reset. stop the electrical activity. Well, is it really to stop the electrical activity? Restart. Well, to stop it so it can restart again. Yeah, exactly. Basically, the goal of it is actually to get all of the cells excited at the same time. By putting a big electrical jolt in it, our goal, is hopefully, is to get all of the cells to excite at the same time. Because if all of the cells of the heart excite at the same time, then they all repolarize at the same time. And if they all repolarize at the same time, as we know, different cells have different spontaneous rates. So hopefully that sinoatrial node cell will fire its action potential and then reestablish the normal pattern. So instead of everything going all asynchronously at the same time, we fire them all at the same time, relax them all at the same time, and then hope to get that synchronous firing rate back in order again. So that is the goal of that, absolutely. All righty. So, as we know, we have this cardiac conduction system. We have these autorhythmic cells that make up 1% of the myocardium, don't have a resting membrane potential, and they produce their own spontaneous action potentials. But as we also talked about, if I were to take one of those sinoatrial node cells out and put it in a Petri dish and provide it with all the oxygen and nutrients it needs, it would beat at a rate of about 100 beats per minute. Is that your heart rate right now? Is your heart rate always 100 beats per minute and never changes? No. No, it is constantly being modified. So while the basic heart rate is intrinsic, it can be modified. And remember last time we talked about modified by the autonomic nervous system and modified by hormones. And we also talked about how that modification takes place. What event actually occurs that makes it beat slower or makes it beat faster? How do we actually change the heart rate? What did we do? Added norepinephrine. Okay, and what did that norepinephrine do? 
increase the heart rate. How? How did it make it be faster? What is that norepinephrine? Someone help her out if you guys don't know if she's not by sure. Short, by shortening the uh, low deep, the, what is it, pacemaker potential? Excellent. It's shortened. I like that. The pacemaker potential. Or again, if you wanted to be, uh, and again, that's definitely the fancy term, but remember this was also that slow depolarization. It, it, uh, it does that by opening chemically gated sodium channels in the cell. Right. In the case of norepinephrine, it's sped up. Uh, the time to reach threshold. So there was a shorter postsynaptic uh, pacemaker potential, slow, uh, a faster slow depolarization. And what type of channels again did norepinephrine open that allowed us to reach threshold faster? Anyone remember? Sodium. Sodium channels. Chemical gated. Yep, chemically gated sodium channels. Excellent. Perfect. So then, and that of course is how our sympathetic did it. So how did our parasympathetic modify heart rate? What neurotransmitter did it use? Acetylcholine, excellent. What kind of channels did it open? You guys aren't instilling me in a lot of faith. These are the things that we just covered and we're about to go to pathways, which you got in 430. So if you can't remember this part, I'm really starting to worry about those pathways. Hopefully I scared chloride. you. It opens chloride, chloride, channel. channel. chloride channels, excellent. It opens chloride channels, chloride rushed in. And when chloride rushed in, what effect did that have on the, pace, on the pacemaker potential? Slower depolarization. There you go. It lengthened. Pacemaker potential. Uh, it, it gave us a fast, I mean, I'm sorry, a uh, so this was a faster depolarization. Depolarization. This was the slower depolarization to threshold. Excellent. And that, of course, slowed the heart rate down. Perfect. No new information there. That's awesome. So let's talk about the pathways. The cardiovascular centers, the cardiac centers that regulate the heart rate via the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, both start basically in the medulla of the oblongata. So let's start easy. What is the pathway to the heart for the parasympathetic nervous system. The vagus nerve. There we go. Excellent. Vagus nerve. What was that? Wasn't that one of the cranial nerves? Which cranial nerve was that again? Cranial nerve 10, I think. Yeah, exactly. Cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. Whoops. Not vagus, vagus. There you go. Vagus. There you go. Excellent. So that was the easy one. So now things get a little bit trickier. Anybody remember the sympathetic pathway? To the heart? No, let's see. It's through the endocrine pathway, right? No, not endocrine. No, that's hormones. There, the hormones can be released, you know, and that would be into the blood. So we would definitely get hormones into the blood, and it would get to it that way. So well, one of the Ramey, gray or white. Maybe? Okay, you, all right, we're getting closer there. So obviously, like you talked about, we start in the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord. We come out the white ramus, which takes us to a ganglion. So let's think about this. There were two types of ganglia in the sympathetic nervous system. There were chain ganglia and collateral ganglia. Which ones innervated the heart? Chain or collateral ganglia? I'll give you a hint, it's not collateral. Chain. Chain ganglia is excellent. 
but not just any old chain ganglion, which specific chain ganglia, there were two, innervated the heart. See, when I was teaching you this stuff in 430, you were like, oh, this stuff is crap. I'll never have to know this again. And yet here we are. All right, I'll give you another hint. They are cervical chain ganglia. And how many cervical chain ganglia are there? Two. How many? Three. Three, excellent. What were the three cervical chain ganglia called? Yeah, they're also paravertebral, that is correct. Chain ganglia, paravertebral, both are acceptable. They were in order, one on top, one in the middle, one on the bottom. So what were the three cervical chain ganglia called? The one on top is? Superior, medial, and inferior. Excellent. And which two of them are the ones that innervate the heart? Superior. No. Uh the medial and inferior ones. Then. There you go. Excellent. See how easy that was? Excellent. The middle and inferior cervical chain ganglia innervate the heart. And they do that, remember, by a sympathetic nerve. Clearly not everybody got the memo that the autonomic nervous system was going to be one of the most important things you learned in 430. Because guess what? It controls your visceral organs, like the heart, like the lungs, like the digestive system. So this is not going to be the last time we talk about pathways. So make sure if you didn't remember this or never got it, you go back and look at this stuff. Now, I've written it here in words, but let's look at some pretty pictures because it's a little easier to understand these things with pretty pictures. Here we have our pathway in the parasympathetic from that vagus nerve. Here we have that pathway from the sympathetic into a chain ganglia up to that cervical trunk ganglion and then out uh, to the heart from that sympathetic nerve. Who loved endocrine too much? Ah, really? She she's a. I, I thought she was a. Well, I guess she did. Uh, she's a medical doctor, but I thought she was a nervous system. When I when I saw her, she seemed to be big on the nervous system too. All right. There's one other important thing I want to emphasize about these pathways. All right. Notice when we look at these pathways, the parasympathetic nervous system innervates the SA node and the AV node. Its job, as we talked about, is to lower the heart rate. So by uh, opening those chloride channels, it can slow the heart rate down. But notice the sympathetic pathway. Notice the sympathetic pathway innervates the SA node innervates the AV node, but it also innervates the Purkinje fibers. So notice our sympathetic nervous system doesn't just increase heart rate, but it also increases the force of the contraction. Now, you may not have thought of it in those terms, but you're definitely aware of it. Because when you're loving significant other jumps up from behind the closet door and scares you, not only does your heart beat faster, but stronger as well. You can feel the force of it beating against the wall of your chest. Remember also, our sympathetic nervous system controls blood vessel diameter, whereas our parasympathetic doesn't. So notice what this does is both sympathetic and parasympathetic can control heart rate, but sympathetic also has a more direct control on blood pressure by controlling the blood vessels itself and by controlling the strength of the contraction. 
yes, the parasympathetic nervous system, if we slow the heart down, blood pressure will drop. But the sympathetic nervous system has much more direct control by making more strength to the contraction and because it also controls the diameter of the blood vessels as well. Um, professor. Yes. I don't see these slides in the slides on Canvas. Are you able to add them or am I looking in the wrong spot? Um, I don't know. There you go. So it's in your textbook, it looks like. Um, you got to remember, is this not slide not here at all or is it just doesn't have the picture on it? I don't see it there at all, the regulation of conduction system. Huh. OK, that's weird. Um, as I've said before, I do tinker with these things. So maybe it's in a different location somewhere in there or, or something. We'll go back a few slides, maybe. Um, so I do juggle these things around a little bit because, as I said, I do tinker. So from when I posted these to when I actually do it, you can also take a screenshot. You also have the video of it. Uh, it's also, there you go, slide page 31, someone says. It's also in the textbook. So there's a couple ways that you can get that. So did you find it on slide page 31? No. Maybe, yes, no. Oh, there it is, thank you. Oh, excellent, so yeah, I apologize. I do, like I said, I do uh, shuffle these things around. Uh, go back to the whiteboard. Uh, well, again, the whiteboard stuff, what do I have on the whiteboard? I don't even remember what we were doing on the whiteboard. Um, it was just the pathway written in words and I just missed the Oh, one. no, no, okay, that wasn't the whiteboard. So here, hold on. For that, we have to go back here. And then once we're here, I can go back there. And then once I'm there, I can go, oops, apparently I can't go back. Sorry, I've lost it. Ali, I think I got a screenshot. We can okay. do it again. Here, parasympathetic pathway. What is it? Anyone? This was the easy one, parasympathetic. The vagus nerve. Vagus nerve. Okay, number 10. Oops, not in. Okay, number 10. All right, absolutely. And what was the pathway for the sympathetic? Lateral gray horn. Excellent, lateral gray horn. To white ramus. Horn to white ramus. To, there we go. Okay. Uh, in the middle and or inferior uh, cervical chain ganglia. And again, uh, I use the term chain ganglia, but remember, depending on uh, it's also known as paravertebral. I saw someone mention that as well. Uh, vertebral. Uh, because they, remember they're paired and they long, run along the side of it. Uh, they are also sometimes referred to as trunk ganglion. So all of those are acceptable terms, but it's the middle and inferior cervical ganglia. And then from there, it's a sympathetic nerve to the heart. So there you go which Allison, I know is one of the pathways you had to learn in 430. And it's still confusing and terrible. It's all a blur. <laughs> <laughs> I know it, it's, it's the one bad thing about the way that the class is organized. 430 builds on itself so well, we set up the chemistry, we set up the cells, we do the tissues, we get to the organs and organ systems. And the problem is by the time you get to the end of the semester, everybody's exhausted. But that end of the semester, that last week and a half of autonomic nervous system is some of the stuff that's most important moving on to 430. One. So, but we'll, we'll do some things to help us all remember it as we work our way around. Or if you had a deficient 430 instructor, uh, then A, uh, email them and ask for a refund, and B, I'll help you uh, to uh, make sure you understand this material. <laughs> all right, excellent. All right, so did you get that? All right, perfect, excellent. So there we go. All right, so our next big, now that we've talked about the electrical activity, we can now finally talk about the mechanical activity, the mechanical events that occur because of that electrical activity. Remember, the ECG isn't a measure of it, but it does cause mechanical activities of the heart. Again, it's not measured directly by the ECG. And it allows the 
heart to do its job, to act as a pump. And of course, what drives that movement of the blood? What in fact makes the entire world go round? Pressure. Pressure, there you go, exactly. I know for some of you who didn't have me for 4.30, you may have been thinking money there, you may have been thinking love. No, pressure is what makes the world go round. Absolutely, so it is gonna be those pressure changes Things don't like to be at a high pressure. Beer is another good one. Absolutely. All of those are things that could, but it is truly pressure that makes the world go round. And those pressure changes uh, caused by the change in the, the volume of the cavities is going to right, move the blood and keep it going. So that's what we're going to be talking about next. We're going to be talking about the cardiac cycle. Here are the events in the cardiac cycle. And we will talk about them and go through them step by step. However, one of the warnings I want to give you right now, because on the exam, you may be asked to describe the cardiac cycle. This is not the same thing as describing the pathway through the heart. Every semester, someone gets the cardiac cycle as an essay question, and they tell me how about blood enters into the right atrium from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. It moves through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, out the pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary trunk, out the pulmonary artery to a lung where it gets oxygen, comes back the pulmonary veins to the left atrium, through the bicuspid valve into the um, left ventricle, out the aortic semilunar valve into the ascending aorta and happily ever after. No, that is the pathway of the blood. That is not the cardiac cycle. The cardiac cycle are the mechanical events that are taking place in the heart that pump the blood. All right, so and that's what we're gonna do. Now, looking at the time, I think I wanna come at this fresh. So this is a good starting point to take our first break. So let's go ahead and take a first break. Uh, we're doing good on time today. So let's take a 15 minute break. That means coming back at 9.22. And at 9.22, we will pick up the lecture from there. So any questions? Uh, start the recording at that point. Any questions before we take our break? Could All you right. go back to the previous slide, please? No. This one? Yes, thank okay. you. All right, any other questions? All right, perfect, excellent. So again, uh, stretch, go to the bathroom, get something to eat, get something to drink, get some caffeine, right? Do a bump of Coke, whatever it is you need to do. I'm getting my coffee. So when we come back, we are hitting the ground running. All right, see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty. So our goal is to talk about the cardiac cycle. Now, as we've done in the past, I think, uh, again, the easiest way to do this is to go through this first on our whiteboard. Again, for this, I encourage you to just sit back and cross your arms. Uh, don't write, don't type, just watch, just listen. As I said before, if you're furiously writing down the things that I'm saying, then you're not listening to the things that I'm saying. And if you're not listening to the things that I'm saying, you're not gonna comprehend this information. So to start this process, we need to start with a heart and we'll go with my simple uh, diaphragm, uh, you know, simple schematic diagram that we use of the circle with the cross through the center of it. Uh, we of course need openings. So we know that they're being fed into by veins into the atria. We know we have arteries coming out here and we know we have spaces between the atria and the ventricles. So let's draw some quick blood vessels. Oops. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here, here, here. And that. Excellent. So we have conditions to our atria and ventricles we need to worry about. So let's start with that. At the beginning of our cycle, what is the state of both the atria and the ventricles? Are they relaxed or are they contracted? Relaxed. Relaxed. 
And do we have fancy words for relaxed and contracted? Well, I'm asking. Diastole and systole. There you go. Which one is it? Diastole is relaxation. Excellent. So at the beginning of our cycle, and again, truly it is a cycle. So again, this is an artificial starting point, but it's a meaningful starting point. You are both correct in that they're relaxed and that the state we would call is a state of diastole. A diastole or diastolic. Excellent. Now, there are two other things we'd have to take into consideration as well. What are the conditions of the valves? Valves come in two flavors, atrioventricular valves. Those, of course, are the valves between the atria and the ventricles. And when both the atria and the ventricles are in a relaxed state, what is the condition of these valves? Are they open or are they closed? Open. Open, excellent. Excellent. And the other valves are the semilunar valves, uh, pulmonary semilunar valves and aortic semilunar valves. And when both the atria and the ventricles are relaxed, what is the state of those valves? Closed. Closed. Excellent. Excellent. So I will write them out this time. Atrioventricular valves are open and the semilunar valves are closed. Excellent. So this is our starting point for our cardiac cycle. During this, of course, we know blood is coming back to the atria from the veins because it is always coming back from the atria to the veins, I mean, from the veins to the atria. And because the atrioventricular valves are open, uh, because we are probably sitting or standing upright, because as more blood comes in, the pressure in here increases and the pressure here is lower, blood is going to continue straight from the atria into the ventricles. We call this stage our passive ventricular filling. Our ventricles are filling. Someone remind me what I mean by passive again. Passive in that there is no contraction causing blood to flow into the chamber. Excellent. Passive means we're not using ATP. So you're absolutely correct. There is no energy being used. There is no contraction taking place. So without any energy being used by the heart at all, uh, blood is flowing into the ventricles. And in fact, about 80% of the ventricle fills during this process. However, as we know, the heart doesn't stay in this, whoops, in that relaxed state forever. We need to make another heart. happen there. Oh, sorry, what was the 80%? About 80%, the, the ventricle reaches about 80% of its final volume just from passive, uh, passive uh, filling like this. So the majority of the blood that ends up into the ventricle ends up into the ventricle just by passively pouring into it during this passive filling stage. I forgot to put my openings up here, but we know they're there, so. All right. But we know it's not going to stay at rest forever. We know eventually some of these cells are going to be excited. And which cells get excited first? Atrial. Well, yeah, well, or more specifically, the cells of the sinoatrial node, right? That's what fires first. Uh, that then uh, produces an action potential that spreads through gap junctions across. And you're absolutely right. 
our atria is going to contract. And again, I'm going to start abbreviating this stuff here so it makes sense. And of course, what was the term we said for when it enters that state of contraction? Systolic, exactly. Or a state of systole. Now, has our ventricle changed at all? No. No. So it's still diastolic. So that is going to be the case, right? So we have this contraction that is going on. Let's draw that with some fancy arrows. Contraction, contraction. Of course, when these contract, volume decreases. Volume decreases, and so pressure increases. And I can cheat and then draw some more arrows. So volume decreases, pressure increases, and that forces more blood into the ventricles. This would be our active ventricular filling. So notice ventricular filling occurs in two stages, and this is where about the remaining 20% of the total volume of blood we're going to get into the ventricles occurs. So we have that contraction. Uh, blood is being actively pushed into the ventricles from the atria. And does this change the condition of any of our valves? No. No. So our AV valves are still open and our semilunar valves are still closed. None of that changes. So this is way harder to do on a whiteboard than it is just on the, on the blackboard. Well, I guess it's a whiteboard in the classroom too. I miss chalk. One of the things I loved about college, Davis in particular, Davis has got some great chalkboards. I love going home, just being covered in chalk dust. The tactile sensation, it was a lot of fun. All right, excellent. So here we are filling our ventricle first passively, then actively. All right, questions on that? You like starting IVs because you like causing pain in individuals? <laughs> yeah, starting IVs is actually very fun. I have a great IV story that I won't bore you with right now, but maybe during one of the breaks, I'll tell it to you. All right. Excellent. So <clears throat> our heart is at rest, passively filling the ventricles, and then our atria contract. Now, we know there's a bit of a delay thanks to the atrioventricular node of the sending of the signal down to the ventricle. But eventually that signal reaches the ventricle and eventually the ventricle starts to contract. And so that's really gonna be the key here. What's gonna happen during this phase is that our atria uh, starts to relax. So it enters uh, diastole. And at the same time, our ventricles start to contract. So it's the very beginning of systole. When this occurs, the very beginning of the systolic phase, of course, as we know, there is going to be a start of the contraction to the ventricles. The ventricles start to contract and we are going to start to get an increase in, well, let's be more specific. We're starting to get a decrease in volume and that's gonna to lead to a small increase in pressure. So we're gonna get a small decrease and let's key here being small decrease in volume, which is gonna give us a small increase in pressure. The effect of this small increase in pressure 
is going to be enough to cause the blood that's in here to not to want to be here anymore. And so what's going to happen is the blood is going to try to go back into the atria. And as it tries to go back into the atria, what ends up happening is that our atrial ventricular valves close. So our AV valves now close. However, is a small enough is a small amount of pressure necessarily going to be enough to open up our semilunar valves? Remember on the other side of the semilunar valves is a massive amount of blood in these high pressure arteries that definitely don't want to be at these high pressures. So is it necessarily going to be enough to open up those semilunar valves right at the very beginning? No. 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 So at this stage, our AV valves close, but our semilunar valves are also still closed. Notice at this point, all the valves are closed. Now, this has two effects. If the AV valves are closed, can we get any more blood into the ventricle? No. No more blood can enter the ventricle. What that means is we've reached the total volume, the maximum we've reached, let's say it that way, the max volume of blood in the atria, I mean in the ventricle. And if we've learned anything, we know it's that anatomists love to name everything and they've given a name to this. This is the end uh, diastolic volume. Right. The ventricle is no longer in diastole. We've reached the end diastolic volume. All right. However, here's the other thing that's happening. The pressure in the ventricle continues to increase. Right. If I hadn't gotten my vodka this morning, I mean my coffee this morning, if instead I had gotten a can of soda and I squeeze that can of soda and I squeeze it harder and I squeeze it harder and I squeeze it harder, as I continue to squeeze that can of soda, am I gonna be able to change the volume of Coke that is in that soda? Assuming I haven't popped the top? No. No. And that's what happens here. The pressure in the ventricle continues to change. So the pressure is getting greater, but our volume stays the same. So our pressure is increasing. <laughs> our pressure is increasing, but the volume stays the same. This period of time is what we call the isovolumetric Contraction. Again, big fancy term, but it's all in a name. The ventricles are contracting, but what does ISO mean? Same. Same. So the ventricle is contracting, but the volume isn't changing. The volume changes, the volume stays the same. Now, eventually, as the pressure gets greater and greater and greater, nope. As the pressure gets greater and greater and greater, eventually the pressure in the ventricle is gonna become greater than the pressure in the uh, arteries. Don't need to be cap locked anymore. And when that pressure in the ventricles becomes greater than the pressure in the arteries, what happens then? The semilunar valves are up. Exactly. So notice at this point, our atria are in a complete state of diastole. 
our ventricle is in a complete state of systole. Our AV valves are still closed, but absolutely now what's gonna happen is our semilunar valves are now going to open. So again, gotta draw my spaces here, here and here and here and here and here and here. My AV valves are closed, but now my semilunar valves are forced open. And now that these are forced open, blood is ejected from the ventricles into the arteries. And so not surprisingly, this stage is called ventricular ejection. So our blood is now forced out of the ventricles into the pulmonary trunk in the ascending aorta. All right, questions on that? Now, is our ventricle stay contracted forever? No. No, eventually what's gonna happen The pressure in the arteries will exceed the pressure in the um, ventricles and the semilunar valves will close. Exactly, exactly. Absolutely, perfect. AV valves are still closed, but you have the right idea. Absolutely, our atria are diastolic. But eventually what happens is our ventricle starts to enter diastole itself. It stops contracting. As it starts to enter diastole, then what happens is the pressure in the ventricle starts to drop. At the same time, as you pointed out, we just forced a whole bunch of blood into the arteries. So the arteries have a very high pressure blood. And now the pressure in the arteries is greater than, than the pressure in the ventricles. And as a result of that, these semilunar valves close. So those semilunar valves slam shut. Bang, bang. Now, at this point, do you think we have gotten rid of every single drop of blood that is inside of our ventricle? No. No there's still gonna be a little bit of blood left here in the ventricle. However, we can't get any more of the blood out. So no more, whoops, blood can exit the ventricle. And so as a result of that, we reach our minimum volume of blood in the ventricle. And what do you think we call that? Beginning diastolic volume? Not a bad guess. You kind of get the right idea. In this case, instead, it's end systolic volume. So you absolutely had the right idea. They're definitely related to each other. But in this case, it's end systolic volume. Notice with all four valves closed, something else is gonna be happening here as well. As the ventricle relaxes, the pressure 
in the ventricle decreases, but what happens to the volume of the ventricle? Increases. Does it? With all the valves closed, can I be getting any more blood in or out of it right now? No. No, so in this case, the volume stays the same. So what do you think we call this stage? Um, iso. Isovolumetric. No, if the other one was the isovolumetric contraction, then this must be the isovolumetric. Relaxation. There you go. Perfect. Now, pressure continues to drop. Oops. Didn't leave myself a lot of room here, but we can sneak it in. All right, so as we know, our semilunar valves are closed. We know that our atria is, is diastolic. We know our ventricle is diastolic. They're both at rest. We know our semilunar valves are closed. But there's one more thing that has been happening while we have been filling and pumping that ventricle out. Don't forget that blood is continuously, oops, no, want that to be red. Blood is continuously coming back to the atria this whole time. And so the atria have been passively filling with blood. The ventricle has been relaxing while the atria has been slowly filling. And eventually, the pressure in the atria is now greater than the pressure in the ventricle. Notice, not because the atria are contracting, just because of the volume of blood that is inside of them. And when the pressure in the atria gets greater than the pressure in the ventricle, what's going to happen? Pressure, well, because um, the pressure is greater in the atria, uh, the volume will move to a area of lower pressure. Which would be the ventricle. But how can it get in the ventricle if those AV valves are closed? The valves will open due to the pressure gradient. Bingo. The AV valves will open. And when the AV valves open, we now get the passive filling of the ventricle. Which is right back where we started. And our cycle has made one rotation. We're right back where we started and we're ready to start again. Next thing that's going to happen is the sinoatrial node is going to fire an action potential and the whole thing happens again. Go ahead, I interrupted you. Uh, Dr. Slutsky, for my own curiosity, when the ventricles are relaxed and they have their uh, in systolic volume in them, are they also in a state of negative pressure and therefore are, are sort of drawing blood in from the atria? Or does that no. only happen intrathoracically? 
so no that don't yes you, that, i understand we do have that thoracic pump and the abdominal pelvic pump that do produce those negative pressures that draw it back but really that just affects the blood vessels in fact if you look in your textbook and one of the things we're actually going to look at together uh, we will see these pressure changes there's a very scary illustration in your textbook that i know is very intimidated but we will actually go through it together and see the actual pressure changes that are taking place Excellent. So great question. So no, no, it doesn't become negative. Uh, it, it decreases uh, until it gets lower than the atrial and then those valves open, but it never gets, it never becomes a negative pressure, but we'll actually see that. All right. Excellent. So again, we did this together as a group, but I want to look at all the pretty pictures and all the pretty words. So any questions on this before we go to all the pretty pictures and all the pretty words? So it's known as just one heartbeat, right? This is the whole cycle this is one beat of the well so yes this is one beat of the heart right so this this and again if you were so what we can do that now how how do you measure a beating of the heart if you were to take someone's heart rate how would you do that from the pulsatile wave or if you were to listen apically you'd hear the uh valves closing and you'd count Perfect. There you go, you spoiled my, my secret, but absolutely. So one way to do it is by feeling a systemic blood vessel, typically a distributing artery, uh, where you can feel the blood that is ejected the pressure increase in the, in, the, in the arteries as the pressure increases from the blood being ejected into the arteries. But you could also put your head on somebody's chest and hear that lulling lub-dub sound. Now, as we know, anatomists love to name everything. So what is the name? What are the appropriate anatomical terms for lub dub? Heart tones. True, but what do you call the lub? Is there, is there, a, is there a technical term for lub? Are you talking about the Karatkov sounds? Nope, not talking about those. We'll, we'll talk S1. about those. S1. Yeah, so yeah, S1 and S2, S2 are kind of the names that they give them, but Lub dub is actually the kind of technical terms they use for it. So yes, they'll use S1 and S2 for sound one and sound two, but they also use lub and dub. So it's one of those things that it is. And as Daniel pointed out, that lub and dub is the sound of the valve closing. So the lub is the closing of what? AV valves. Yeah, right here. When these close, that is when we hear the lub, right? And then when the semilunar valves close is when we hear the dub. All right, so excellent. So let's go back and look at the pretty pictures from your textbook and go through the whole thing again. Again, cardiac cycle is a cycle, it's a continuous process. So technically we could start anywhere, but I think it's more meaningful to start at this point when the heart is completely at rest. When the heart is completely at rest, I need this out of my way. Um, when the heart, whoops, why did it do that? There we go. When the heart is completely at rest, we have that passive ventricular filling here the AV valves are open, here the semilunar valves are closed, blood is just flowing continuously into those ventricles. And again, this passive filling uh, gets us to about 80% of our ven total ventricular volume. Then our atria enter a state of systole, increasing their pressure forcing even more blood into the ventricle. Of course, to contract requires ATP, so we are getting an active filling. And remember, this is gonna get us to that maximum volume, and that maximum volume remembers the end diastolic volume. However, remember, we do not reach this. I know I have this written here, but I wanna make sure I emphasize this. We do not reach this until the, uh, the uh, AV valves close. If the AV valves are open, we can still get more blood into the ventricle. So remember the maximum volume is the end diastolic volume, but we do not reach that until the AV valves close. And remember the AV valves aren't going to close until the ventricles start to contract. When the ventricles start to contract, 
that small increase in pressure closes the AV valves. Now all four valves are closed. We've reached our maximum volume of blood and pressure is increasing in the ventricles, but the volume stays the same. So we reach this state of isovolumetric contraction. All the valves are closed, volume stays the same, but the pressure is increasing. Now, as that pressure continues to increase, oops, hold on. Great question, Laura. So as I've always said, I don't care whether you use four steps or five steps in describing this. Different textbooks will describe things in different number of steps. What I care about is that you have the right amount of information. If you want ventricular filling to be one thing and you just wanna talk about how there's both a passive and an active part of it, that's fine. If you wanna consider them separate steps, that's fine, I don't care. Just make sure you have all the information. If you can somehow break this up into 14 steps, that's fine as well, as long as all the information's there and it's in the right order. So I care about the information, not how you organize it. Obviously it's gotta be in order, but, but yeah, no, something as simple as how many steps, I, I, that's not important. Great question though, I appreciate that. All right, eventually the pressure in the ventricle becomes great enough and then when it becomes great enough, it is gonna force the blood out of those semilunar valves. So the pressure becomes greater than the pressure in the arteries and we're able to force that blood out, what we call our ventricular ejection. Is that ejection, uh, ventricular ejection, is that the same as your ejection fracture? fracture? Not familiar with the term ejection fracture, but my guess would be it's either a measure of the time of how long that is or the volume that is being released. But I, I'll be honest, I'm not familiar with that, that term. Again, cardiovascular is not my area of expertise. I like it, but it, you know, I'm, a, I'm a brain guy. I don't mess with the squishy, squishy things like the heart. All right, eventually the ventricles start to relax. When they start to relax, the pressure in the arteries becomes greater than the pressures in the ventricles. And as the blood tries to force its way back, it slams those doors closed. At that point, all of our valves are now closed. We have reached the minimum amount of blood in our ventricle. And as our ventricles relax and the volume stays the same, we are at that ISO volumetric relaxation. But notice the picture's done a nice job of showing this. The atria have slowly been filling with blood during this process. And as the pressure in the ventricle drops, eventually it drops below the pressure of the atria. Again, not because the atria are contracting, but just because there's blood in the atria. So eventually the pressure of the atria becomes greater than the pressure of the ventricle. That blood forces those AV valves open and we are back to the passive filling of the ventricle and the whole process begins anew. And we can put it all together into the pretty picture here. One, two, three, four, five. See, they got five stages too. They just number them differently. This is part of that scary looking illustration that I was telling you about, where it does a nice job of showing you how the valves and the blood is moving in the heart. 
It gives them the names of the phases and I don't care that you memorize those, but it shows the states of the channels, of the valves, right? Open and closed, then closed and open, then open and closed. It shows the periods of time where they're both closed, that isovolumetric contraction and that isovolumetric relaxation stage. But the other thing it shows you on this chart, and this is the thing that Daniel was asking about, and I think is an excellent illustration that is incredibly terrifying when you first look at it. But if you actually spend some time looking at it, you can see how this totally makes sense. Now, this graph is showing you the, the pressure changes in the left atria and ventricles. atrium, left ventricle, and the uh, ascending aorta. Why not do the right? The pressures are naturally lower on the right. Yeah, right. Remember, the left side has larger muscle, higher pressures, because we have to worry about pumping the blood to the entire body we see the exact same type of pressure changes on the right side, but the pressure changes are smaller because we're dealing with a lesser pressure because we have a shorter distance to travel to the lungs and we don't want super high pressure blood going to the lungs. So it changes the exact same way, just the magnitude is less. This one shows it nicer. So let's take a look at what's happening. Notice at first, this phase here, and actually we'll use our highlighter to do this. From here to here is when we are getting that passive filling. Of the ventricle. Notice the blood is pouring into the atria. The atria has a higher pressure than the ventricle. And so that blood is going from the atria to the ventricles from the high pressure to the low pressure. But then we see this bump. Why might this bump occur? Notice they've given you a big hint as to why there might be a bump here. What causes this increase in pressure? Atrial the valve's closing. No, not the valve closing, but notice the atria enters a state of systole. Uh, the atria contracts. When the atria contracts, it increases the pressure, forcing more blood into the ventricle. But again, notice the pressure in the atria is still greater than the pressure in the ventricle. So those AV valves stay open. But then the ventricle starts to contract. And when the ventricle starts to contract, we hit this big important point right here. What happens at this point? Let's make it even smaller to really emphasize. What happens at this point right here? AV valves close. Why? Increased pressure in the ventricle. Yeah. In this point, the pressure in the ventricle is now greater than the pressure in the atria. And so as a result of this, the AV valve closes. That is when we get our lub. Notice, and I'll highlight this, we then get a continued increase in the pressure of the ventricle. But during this stage, what are the states of all the valves? Closed. Closed. So this, remember, our volume is staying the same. Our pressure is increasing. This is our iso volumetric contraction. But then something else fancy happens. What's happening right there? The lunar valves open. Absolutely, why? The ventricular pressure went higher. 
Yep. Pressure in the ventricle is now greater than the pressure in the arteries. And so as a result of that, our semilunar valve opens. Absolutely. And as it opens, notice we force blood into the artery. And as we force blood into the artery, the pressure in the artery increases as well. But then the ventricle starts to relax. And as the ventricle starts to relax, the pressure in the ventricle starts to decrease until something magical happens here. What happens right here? My lunar valves close. Why? Because the pressure in the system is greater than the pressure in the ventricles. Excellent. The pressure in the artery is now greater than uh, the pressure in the ventricle. And as a result of that, our semilunar valve closes. Now, notice one other really interesting thing happens at this point. When that semilunar valve closes, notice there is a spike in the pressure in the aorta. Why? It's called, notice it's called the dichrotic notch. Any idea why this might occur? The backwash bounces off the semilunar valve. Exactly. Think of it this way. You guys, again, I have to work on my analogies. So let's pretend we were in the classroom and we were in the classroom and the fire alarm went off and we were all in an orderly fashion leaving the door of the classroom. And then somebody slammed the door closed, right? And Laura's there right in the front. She is going to bounce into that. And then Allison's going to bounce off of Laura. And then Marion's going to bounce off of her. And then Allison's going to bounce off of her. We're going to get this big, huge congestion as everybody kind of bounces around that. And as we know, when you produce that congestion, you produce that turbulence. That turbulence, that congestion increases pressure. So we get that turbulence that is producing from the slamming of that door. And so that's why we see that little spike from that turbulence, from that disturbance that is occurring. Notice we then have the pressure going down in the ventricle, but all the valves are open. Uh, pardon me, all the valves are closed. So of course, during this stage, what's going on? Isovolumetric relaxation. Oops. Excellent. Lastly, notice it's been subtle, but there has been a slow increase in the pressure in the left atrium as blood comes back to it until eventually the pressure of the atrium, which is increasing and the pressure of the ventricle, which is decreasing. We reach that point where now the pressure in the atria is greater than the pressure in the ventricle. And what happens at that point? AV valves open, exactly. And we start the passive fill, and the whole process starts all over again. So notice, as I mentioned, when you first looked at this, it may have been confusing. It may have been intimidating. But as you can see, it does an excellent job of actually showing us exactly how those changes in pressures lead to the changes of the events, lead to the movement of the blood. Pressure makes the world go round. And here we see it. So to get back to your original uh, question, Daniel, notice during that isovolumetric relaxation, the pressure is dropping, but it's not becoming a negative pressure. It's just decreasing until it decreases below the atrial pressure. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Did that, did that. All right, excellent. And then as we talked about, the heart sounds, the auscultations, the lub-dub, 
And again, they are also called S1 and S2, but lub and dub are fine. And what did we say called the dub, the lub, cause the lub? Closing of the AV valves. Yeah, closing of the AV valves. And then the dub then is closed by the, caused by the closing of the semilunar valves. Uh, you can, and again, if we were actually in the classroom, you would actually be doing this on each other. You would have the opportunity to actually listen to uh, the, and try to isolate the individual valves. So notice here, this nice illustration from your lab manual does a good job of showing where you would put a stethoscope to try to isolate the sound of the individual valves to be able to identify the sound of the individual valves. And as we talked about last time, the valves close in alphabetical order. The, of the two semilunar valves, the aortic closes before the pulmonary. In the two atrioventricular valves, the bicuspid or mitral closes before the tricuspid. We, I think we mentioned that last time, but I don't remember if we talked about why. Why do they close in alphabetical order? Why does the aortic semilunar and the bicuspid uh, atrioventricular valve close first? to prevent backflow into the atria or ventricles during well, their respective. That's why all the valves close. All the valves close to stop backflow. So why do the ones on the, if you think about it in the, uh, alphabetical order, the ones on the left side close before the ones on the right side? What makes the world go round? Pressure. pressure. Differences in pressure. Remember, as we talked about, the left side has higher pressures. It's dealing with higher pressures, higher pressures and greater pressure changes. So those higher pressures and greater pressure changes are what cause the left side to close first, both the aortic semilunar valve and the, uh, and the uh, uh, tricuspid, no, pardon me, and the bicuspid or mitral semilunar valve, uh, atrioventricular valve. Both of the left side valves close first. All right. We've covered almost everything associated with this, except for one more major factor. And that one more major factor is the last little part of this scary looking chart. Someone gave me the page number before. What page number was this on? Did you guys mention it? 694. 694, excellent. Notice there's a chunk of it missing. The chunk of it missing has to do with the amount of blood that is actually pumped out of. And again, this is all dealing with the left ventricle. So notice we have the amount of blood that is being moved by the left ventricle. And we call that the stroke volume. The stroke volume is a measure of the amount of blood. Now, obviously to calculate the measure of the amount of blood, we need to know the maximum blood that is gonna be in the ventricle. And then from that, we need to subtract the minimum and that would tell us the difference. And luckily we know what those values are called. So if we were to calculate the stroke volume, how would we do that? Heart rate times cardiac output? No. Again, based on what we have here, how would we calculate the stroke volume? If we need to know the difference between the maximum volume, so let's go back a step. What did we say the maximum volume of blood that you have in a ventricle is? It's the ending diastolic. Yeah. You would take the end diastolic volume. Minus the ending systolic volume. There you go. Minus the end systolic volume. So that would be, so again, we can write that out now that we've used those. Stroke volume equals end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. That is how we would calculate it. How would you define it? How would you define stroke volume? The volume of blood remaining in the ventricle. Is the blood after, remaining? After it's contracted? 
Well, isn't that what n systolic volume is? Oh yeah. Okay. So what would how would you define stroke volume? Oh, the difference. There you go. Ash has got it exactly. The difference. You define stroke volume as the amount of blood ejected, and you would get partial credit for your answer from one ventricle from one cardiac cycle. So if, for instance, let's use the values here. What is the stroke volume of the left ventricle? You have all the information you need to answer this on the screen right now. 120. Okay, what is 120 a measure of? Milliliters. True, okay. But what is that? So let's take a look at this. Let's take, a, maybe let's take a look at the graph and see what's actually happening in this graph. Notice we see a slow increase in the uh, ventricular volume. And then there is a bump on the increase. What's happening in that part? The finishing of the filling of the ventricle? Yeah, so, but why is there that bump at the end? Well, 80% goes in passively and 20% is filled. Exactly, this is passively. the passive filling, this is the active filling of the ventricle. Then notice what happens. The volume stays the same for a brief period of time while pressure increases. Isovolumetric contraction. Then blood is pumped out during the ventricular ejection. But once again, we hit a flat part. That flat part, the volume stays the same while the pressure is decreasing. We have our end systolic volume during that isovolumetric relaxation. And then we start to get that passive and then active filling of the ventricle again. So notice the stroke volume is the amount of blood that is pumped out of the ventricle from this one contraction. There you go, Laura's figured it out. You take the end systolic volume, uh, end diastolic volume, which is 120. You subtract the end systolic volume, which is 50. And even with your socks on, hopefully you can figure out that the difference there is 70 milliliters. So the stroke volume of the left ventricle is 70 milliliters. Excellent, Ash, that's where we're going next. We're gonna talk about cardiac output next. So we'll get to there. There's one more important fact that we need to determine. And that is, what is the stroke volume of the right ventricle? We know the stroke volume now of the left ventricle. How the heck can we figure out the stroke volume of the right ventricle? Do we need another graph to figure that out? I'll give you a hint. The answer is actually no. Didn't you say that they're basically the same? not basically the same, they need to be the same. So absolutely, the stroke volume of the right ventricle is gonna be what? 70 ml. 70 ml, exactly. Think of it, you've got two pumps working together to move blood through your body. If one pump moved 100 milliliters of blood every time it pumped, and the other side only moved 50, you'd start to get a congestion and a backing up of blood to keep a continuous blood flow, both sides of the heart have to move the same amount of blood. So remember, we talked about they're different in their pressures. Right and left ventricles use different pressures. 
but they must move the same amount of blood. They must move the same amount of blood. So if the left ventricle moves 70 milliliters, the right ventricle needs to move 70 milliliters. Uh, you need me to go back a few slides to what, Izzy? This one? No, I was just saying that to someone else. Oh, okay. Oh, did I, am I not up to date? Sorry. Okay, I see there's more stuff. Go back to the whiteboard. Uh, oh, wait, these are way old. Okay, I'm sorry, hold on. There you go. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I was, I, I was way up at the top of what was there before. So I apologize. Excellent. All right. Yeah. They have to be synchronous. Um, have to move the same amount. Perfect. All right. Excellent. So with that in our pocket, we can now get back to the question someone was asking. You know, Ash was quest asking about cardiac output. So let's talk about that stuff. Get some quick cardiac cycle definitions. How do we define heart rate? The amount of contractions in one minute. True, or I think again, to be more consistent, the number of cardiac cycles in one minute, All right? Absolutely, you're right. Number of times that it contracts, but again, we gotta be careful because you could argue, well, you've got an atrial contraction and a ventricular contraction, so that would be two. Right, so we wanna think of it in terms of the cardiac cycle. Excellent, that's how we're gonna define that. And again, obviously it varies for person to person, but a good average is 75 beats per minute, meaning that one cardiac type cycle takes about 0 0.8 seconds. As we just learned, we define stroke volume as the amount of blood moved from one ventricle in one cardiac cycle we also learned how to calculate that and that is of course oops since i don't have it here we'll remind ourselves of that stroke volume equals and diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume So then we get to the question that Ash asked, cardiac output. How would we define cardiac output? The efficiency with the heart rate and stroke volume. Okay, I, 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 it's definitely related to the heart rate and stroke volume. I wouldn't necessarily say it's vols of efficiency, I, uh, but again, obviously we want it to be efficient, right? So again, we're dealing with the measures of the beat per minute. We know how many times the heart has a contractile cycle in a minute, and we know how much blood is pumped from one ventricle in one cardiac cycle. So if we put those two things together, we get the total amount of blood moved by one ventricle in one minute of time. And so of course, how would we calculate that cardiac output? Heart rate. Yep. Heart coming. rate. What about the heart rate? Time stroke, stroke volume. Time stroke volume. There you go. Exactly. Just that simple. Cardiac output is the volume of blood pumped by one ventricle in one minute of time. And we calculate that. Oh, we did all of that. See, there we did this. This was in the wrong place. We should have moved this. There, let's do that. You guys are all furiously writing anyway, so that gives me a chance to do a quick tinker. I want this there. Excellent. Oops. 
just did. Okay. Oh, no. Didn't want that. Oh, bother. All right. This is the slide I want. This is where I want the show to be. This is where I want us to be. So we did this already. Stroke volume, end diastolic volume minus the, the end diastolic volume by the end systolic. We figured that out. We did that calculation. We did all of those. So that brings us to where we are here. Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. So let's do some simple math because we already kind of figured this part out. What did we say the average heart rate was? 75. What did we say a good average stroke volume was? 70. 70. So what's 70 times 75? If you have to take your shoes and socks off to figure this one out, that's okay. Or you can just do it on your uh, smart devices. What's our answer here? 5,250. How much? 5,250. 5,250 milliliters. How much blood on average does a person have in their body? A pint per 10 pounds-ish, right? So what does that work out to? Let's stick with, since we're dealing with milliliters, let's stick with milliliters. Anybody know a good average value? How about around five liters? Five to six is usually a good value, but somewhere around five, especially if you're a little type person. So if you think about it, essentially your entire volume of blood is moved through your heart every minute, every day, not even taking Sundays off, all right? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, twice on Sundays. It is an incredibly impressive. Yep, I agree. So crazy to fathom. So like I said, when we look at the heart, it isn't very impressive to look at, but what it does functionally is truly remarkable. And that's while you're sitting here at rest. As we know, when you exercise, right, when you are jogging on the treadmill, running, uh, you know, around the block, or running from a bear with an ax, your heart can beat even faster. Your cardiac output can be even faster, even more. We actually do that as a ratio that we call the cardiac reserve. For an average individual, you and me, the maximum cardiac output uh, ratio is about, the cardiac reserve is somewhere between four and five, and you just use five as a simple measure. If your cardiac reserve was five, what would that mean? Well, again, let's use simple numbers. If at rest, your heart moved five liters of blood at rest, when your heart was beating at its maximal, when you had your maximal cardiac output, what would your maximal cardiac output be? It's a ratio. So five over one would be the same as what over five? One over five. So again, this is a ratio. Cardiac reserve is a ratio. So it is a ratio of, if your cardiac reserve is five, really that means five over one. So if it's five over one, that is equal to what number over five? 25. There you go, 25. Fun with fractions, right? You didn't think you'd ever have to use math again either. 25. So that means when you are running from that bear with an ax, your heart, it can be pumping as much as 25 liters of blood out of its ventricle every minute. And that's us mere mortals, right? When you talk about uh, professional athletes, right? Someone like LeBron James, someone along those lines, a professional athlete, their cardiac reserve could be as much as seven or eight. 
meaning that they could be pumping as much as 35 liters of blood through one ventricle of their heart every minute. Now, obviously that can't be sustained for a prolonged period of time, but even to do that for a minute straight is pretty damn amazing. But where did the 25 come from? Uh, for what, for you and me, you and me, your cardiac reserve, my cardiac reserve is somewhere around the four or five range. Meaning that uh, if you normally at rest pump five liters of blood, then when you're at maximal activity level, your heart is pumping as much as 25 liters of blood through your heart every minute. Because when you're running on that treadmill or you're chasing your kids around the house or you're running from that bear with an ax, obviously your heart rate's going up, the volume of blood you're pumping out is going up, all of those things are going up. So yeah, five times five, five what you normally do times your cardiac reserve val a value, which is a ratio, really five over one. So fun with fractions, right? All righty, questions on that? Now, obviously this means we need to control and modify our cardiac output. And if we're gonna control and modify our cardiac output, there are basically two ways we can do it. Cardiac output is determined by your heart rate and your stroke volume. So if you change your heart rate, you change your cardiac output. If you change your stroke volume, you change your cardiac output. Stroke volume is determined by our end diastolic and our end systolic volume. So anything that changes these changes this, which changes that. And as we've already talked about, our autonomic nervous system and our hormones, we know can change the heart rate and change cardiac output. So what we need to do next is talk about ways that we would regulate this process. How can we control our cardiac output? Again, some of these are things we've already talked about, like the autonomic nervous system and hormones and stuff, but we need to also talk about stroke volume as well. This is a good point for our next break. Let's go ahead and take our second break here. It is 1035 right now. Uh, so let's come back at 1050 and at 1050, we will finish this off. So we will restart at 1050 and I will start the recording at that point. So any questions before we take our next break? Quick question, Professor. Yes. You said that um, when we are at our maximal capacity, um, high intensity exercise or something like that, we're doing 25 liters um, on average via one ventricle, correct? Correct. And that's like um, per a minute? Yes, or? in one minute. Gotcha. Yeah. So yes, at one minute of time, you would be pumping, If again, if your heart is producing its maximal cardiac output, then yes, it could be pumping. And again, it's gonna vary from person to person, but somewhere between about 20 and 25 liters per minute. Now, as we talked about, that can't be maintained for a long period of time, but just the fact that he can even do it for a short period of time is pretty darn impressive. Thank you. So great question, Ash. No, really, Ash, the, the, I see our class as being four and a half hours. I know the way it's in the schedule is we have one break of, I think it's 20 minutes between our lecture and our lab component. But especially when we're online like this, I don't find that to be convenient. Um, and rather than artificially just breaking, uh, just to make sure that we always break at 930 or something like that, I, uh, I, I think it's much more important to find natural and obvious breaks in the information so that we can maintain the cohesiveness of what we are talking about. I do try to keep the lectures to about one hour, one hour and 15 minute chunks uh, before we take a break because I know there's only so much that we can handle. Uh, but uh, but I, I pretty much let the information determine when we're gonna take our break. So that's how we do that. So no, it's not gonna necessarily be at the same time every day. But I usually try to do it every hour, hour and 15 minutes or so. Sometimes, depending on the information, we'll go a little long. Sometimes we'll go a little short. We'll only have 50 minutes of information, but if it's a really good breaking point, then we'll take our break early. So it's really, it's the, in, it's the, uh, it's the content that determines when the breaks are gonna be. Great question. Any others? All right, see you guys in 15 minutes.
All righty, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, there was a great question that was asked either uh, during the break or it came uh, before the break and I missed it, so I wanna apologize for that. Uh, so the, the question was basically about the implications for those athletes of having such a high cardiac reserve. Uh, I, I, it's not necessarily a negative thing that you're able to pump more blood out of your heart. If you think about it, if you're a, a professional athlete, uh, you know, a, exercising at the peak of your performance level, you want to make sure you're able to get oxygen and nutrients to the muscles so that they can produce that ATP aerobically without having to rely on glycolysis, without having to build up lactic acid and causing that fatigue and everything that goes along with it. Uh, and basically what happens is the reason they're able to pump more is their hearts become more efficient. In fact, typically with a professional athlete, uh, the heart rate actually decreases. So their resting heart rate is typically lower than an average individual's because their heart is more efficient at pumping that blood. It is after all a muscle and muscles can be worked out. And so at, typically at rest, it's at a lower heart rate so that as it increases in heart rate, their cardiac output increases and, and they can reach levels higher than we can. So it isn't necessarily a, a, a risk. Uh, I, I guess that you could say there's some remodeling, but really it's just a, an increase in efficiency that I think it, that is, is most occurring from that. So that's a great question. So any others before we move on? All right. So. Like I said, our goal is to basically talk about these four factors that play a role in allowing us to change the cardiac output and to talk about how they would change the cardiac output. Uh, so for instance, uh, we already have some of this down. We talked about this already, our sympathetic and parasympathetic pathways. And just tell me the nerves that innervate the uh, heart. So let's not worry about the whole pathway, but what in the parasympathetic, what nerve innervates the heart? Parasympathetic pathway, what nerve innervates the heart? We already did this at least twice today. Vegas. Vegas, there you go, cranial nerve uh, 10. Oops. And for the sympathetic, what is the nerve that actually innervates the heart? You kick yourself and you remember it. What is the name of the sympathetic nerve that in innervates the heart? Sympathetic cardiac nerve? Yeah, sympathetic nerve. There you go. Exactly. I told you you'd kick yourself and you figured it out. Exactly. The name is the sympathetic nerve. Excellent. What neurotransmitter is released by uh, cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve? Norepinephrine. For parasympathetic? Acetylcholine. 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 Excellent. All right. And what kind of effect does it have? Well, let's wait. Hold on. Let's 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 take one step forward. Uh, so, let's, releases acetylcholine. What is the effect? Slows depolarization. Exactly. So it slows heart rate. And if it slows heart rate, what effect would that have on cardiac output? Decrease. Decreases. Excellent. Slows heart rate because what are the areas of the heart that are affected by the parasympathetic pathway? What precisely on the heart does the parasit does that vagus nerve innervate? SA and AV nodes. There you go. The SA node and the AV node. And since we're not really talking about those, I'll let, allow the abbreviations here. Let's do the same thing for the sympathetic. We know it's a sympathetic nerve. What neurotransmitter does it release? Norepinephrine. Norepinephrine. Uh, what is the effect? Increase in heart rate. Increase heart rate. And if it increased heart rate, what effect would that have on cardiac output? Increase. Increases. Excellent. And what areas of the heart does the sympathetic nervous system innervate? Is it the SA node, the AV node, and then the Purkinje fibers? 
and the Purkinje fibers. Excellent. Now I used a lot of abbreviations on here. Obviously, if this was an essay question, you would not be abbreviating everything. You'd be writing all this out. But since we had already covered this once, I didn't want to spend too much time on it. And of course, as we also talked about, we have the pretty picture that goes along with this as well. However, and let's actually cheat. Let's go back two steps and put that back up on here. How are these regulated? Right, if we think about this in terms of maintaining homeostasis, how do we know when we need the heart to beat faster or we need to beat the heart to beat slower? Remember, as we talked about to maintain homeostasis, there has to be some disturbance. Change in demand of oxygen requirements. There you go. We have to have some disturbance and then obviously you have to have a receptor that is going to be able to allow us to perceive that. Absolutely. One of the possible disturbances would be oxygen carrying capacity. Where do you think that might be um, measured? Any idea where the receptors for that might be? The brain? Brain might be a good guess. Heart would be a good guess as well. Those would be good places to have them. But, arteries. I'm sorry? So arteries is a closer guess. There are a couple locations in the arteries. You're talking about the chemoreceptors, right? Yeah, so exactly. So we have chemoreceptors that are housed in two locations. Uh, well, really three main ones. Uh, one is what is known as the carotid body, bodies. These are located basically where the common carotid splits to the internal and external carotid. So if you think about that, those are the ones that are carrying the blood to the brain. We probably need to know the condition of the blood going there. The others are in the aortic arch known as the aortic bodies. They're measuring the blood basically being distributed to everywhere else, the condition of that that way. But the other place where we have chemoreceptors that measure oxygen is in the kidneys. After all, while you're sitting here at rest, about 25% of your blood is being directed to your kidneys to be filtered. So while you're at rest, your kidneys are receiving a massive amount of blood. And so it's not surprising that we would be measuring oxygen carrying capacity there as well. So absolutely, how much oxygen the blood is carrying is something that we wanna dynamically keep track of. But the other thing that is gonna influence the heart rate is our blood pressure. And if we're gonna measure blood pressure, we need some type of basically what is a stretch receptor. These stretch receptors measure how much a blood vessel is being stretched. They're constantly firing action potentials. And the more they stretch, the faster they produce those action potentials. These type of pressure related receptors are what we call baroreceptors. And these baroreceptors are also found in the carotid bodies and in the aortic bodies. And they help us to maintain constant blood pressure because as we know, pressure is what makes the world go round and pressure is also what makes blood go round in your body. So to keep an appropriate circulation a continuous circulation of blood in the body, we need to maintain appropriate pressures. And so those are me measured by baroreceptors in the carotid and aortic bodies. Let's think about how this might work. We have a blood vessel and in that blood vessel, there is suddenly an increase in blood pressure. As that blood pressure increases, blood pressure is obviously the force of the blood pushing on the walls around it. And that causes the blood vessel to expand. When the blood 
uh, vessel expands, what happens to those baroreceptors? Baroreceptors, there we go. As it stretches, as the blood vessel expands, these baroreceptors stretch. And as they stretch, what did I say happens to their firing rate? It increases. Yeah. We see an increase in action potential firing. This information is sent to our command center. And as we know, that command center would be the medulla oblongata. Where it processes the information, makes a decision on that information. And based on that information, if it is going to uh, lower the blood pressure, which of our two autonomic pathways is it going to want to use? If it's lowering it, would it be the parasympathetic? Yeah, exactly. It lowering it? Exactly. We want a parasympathetic uh, action potential. So our parasympathetic nervous system sends a signal to our effector. Of course, our effector is the heart and in this case, the SA node and the AV node. Of course, as we know, it releases acetylcholine. And that acetylcholine opens chloride channels and heart rate decreases. When heart rate decreases, what effect does that have on cardiac output? Decrease. Decreases which means we have less blood in the blood vessels. And if we have less blood in the blood vessels, what happens to the blood pressure? Decrease. Blood pressure decreases. And we are back in balance, right? That whole homeostatic process of receptors, command center, effectors, all of that stuff we learned about in 430, we're using again all not new stuff that we have talked about and used before. And so in this way, we can make dynamic changes by constantly changing how much parasympathetic and sympathetic input is going to the heart. And remember, that's the advantage of having organs with dual innervation. That's a fancy word. What does dual innervation mean again? Innervated two different ways. Yep. And since we're talking about the autonomic nervous system, what would those two different ways be? Sympathetic and parasympathetic. Exactly. So organs get dual innervated by uh, sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. It allows us to have, remember what we called that, oops, autonomic tone. And remember, as we talked about in 430, most organs have dual innervation. Can someone remember an organ that doesn't have dual innervation? The kidney? Kidney, exactly. Uh, I gave you one earlier. Most blood vessels. Remember I said most blood vessels are just innervated by the sympathetic. Of course, there's that pesky word most. Not all the blood vessels are only innervated by the sympathetic. There are a few blood vessels innervated by the parasympathetic. Anybody remember what those were again? It's a good thing we won't be responsible for blood vessels on this test. Oh, wait. Come on, I know you guys know, even if you don't know, you know the blood vessels associated with the erectile tissue, All right? That means penis in males, that means clitoris and labia in females. Arousal, remember, as we talked about in 430, and we will talk about again in the reproductive system, is a parasympathetic reflex. And while you may not have thought of it in those terms, you are all aware of that, because back in ancient days, you used to be able to go on third dates. 
right? And the third date was that very special date where you take that special guy out for a special meal because you expect something from him in return. Of course, he knows that you expect something in return for that special meal, and he knows he's going to have to perform, and he may be a little anxious about that. And if his sympathetic nervous system is a little too high, his parasympathetic may have him giving him some difficulty rising to the task at hand. So your job, of course, to get what you need out of that young lad is to ply him with alcohol, right? Make him feel relaxed, and then you can get what you need from him, All right? Did your daughter learn this, 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 uh, this lesson well, Laura? I'm sorry, we're doing this. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just talking about sex with your daughter there. I feel bad. All right, excellent. Allison's are too, excellent. So yes, exactly. Remember, children, remember it's always important. Ply boys with alcohol and then you can get what you need from them, okay? But not too much, because then we have that whole whiskey problem that you know the parents can teach you about, all right? <laughs> Okay, excellent. But the so those are the only blood vessels that are not controlled. Kidneys, uh, uh, adrenal gland, skin, blood vessels, most blood vessels, those are the things that we talk about uh, that uh, are not, <laughs> exactly, those are the ones that do not have that autonomic tone. They're just innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. But most organs have dual innervation, have that precise control. And so we can have these dynamic processes like this. All right. Excellent. All right, so we have that. And again, these are the things that we kind of already learned about because we talked about it already today and we talked about it uh, in 430. However, as, as yeah, it, there's nothing I love more than making my children uncomfortable as well. It is very, very fun. <laughs> I just gave them my anatomy and physiology book and I let them figure it out for themselves. All right. However, our nervous system is not the only thing that can influence our heart rate, right? As we also know and have talked about, hormones uh, have a big effect. We talked about acetylcholine, uh, right? We talked about epinephrine and norepinephrine, or adrenaline and noradrenaline. Anybody know what T3 and T4 are? From the thyroid. Yeah, these are thyroid hormones. For right now, you get to call them T3 and T4. When we get to uh, when we get to the endocrine system in the next section, you will have to call them triiodothyronine and also thyroxine. So you will have to uh, talk about those that way. Um, but for now, T3 and T4, those are ones that increase general metabolism. So these are all things that can increase heart rate. However, as we learned in 430, when we're talking about action potentials, ion concentrations are very, very important as well. So imbalances to sodium or potassium levels, calcium, as we know, makes cells do wonky things. So imbalances to our ion concentrations can also impact our heart rate, either increasing it or decreasing it, which of course would affect cardiac output. All right. And then of course, there's other factors as well. Age, gender, physical fitness. We just talked about how those professional athletes typically have a lower heart rate. Temperature, how does temperature affect heart rate? Doesn't it go up? If temperature goes up, heart rate goes up. If temperature goes down, heart rate goes down as well, right? That's a problem with, and again, hopefully none of you, although actually now we probably could do it, but uh, places like Chicago, for instance, they have this yearly tradition on the winter solstice, a bunch of people will go out and jump into you know, the lake or in the river in Chicago or in Cleveland, places like that, they'll go and jump into it, do one of those polar bear plunges. One of the concerns you have to have with that polar bear plunge is that rapid dramatic drop in temperature from jumping into that ice cold water can actually cause a rapid dramatic drop in heart rate. And in extreme cases, it can actually cause the heart to stop when they do that. So it is something that is a risk that you have to be careful about. So there's all sorts of other pain, all sorts of other factors that can influence and modify heart rate. And of course, the relationship is simple. Heart rate goes up, cardiac output goes up. Heart rate goes down, cardiac output goes down. All right. Go back a slide for a second. Um, down. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Give me a chance to drink my vodka. I mean water. All right, excellent. So heart rate is pretty simple and straightforward. Let's talk stroke volume. Stroke volume is a little bit trickier. Obviously, to affect stroke volume, we need to be able to influence or we need to be able to change either the end diastolic volume, which if you think about it, is the amount of, uh, of blood we get into the ventricle or we need to be able to change the end systolic volume. And that is the amount of blood we get out of the ventricle. So those are the two factors that we have to be able to change. And there are some ways that we are able to do that. One of them is what we call preload. Again, we're filling that chamber of the ventricle. And you could kind of think of it as filling a water balloon. If you are filling a water balloon from a faucet, is there just one amount of water you can get into the blood, I mean, into the balloon that way? No, one thing you can do is you could leave the faucet on for a longer period of time. So obviously if we relax the ventricle for a longer period of time, that is going to allow it to fill more rapidly. However, if I only can hold that water balloon on there for three seconds, the other thing I can do is turn the faucet on faster. So the other thing that I can do that would affect preload is return the blood back to the heart faster. If for instance, we constrict uh, systemic veins, we can get the blood to move back to the heart faster. And again, you probably haven't thought of it in these terms, but you're all aware of this. One of the things we talked about in 430 is that our skin is a blood reservoir. While you're sitting here calmly in class, the blood is very slowly chugging its way through all the blood vessels of your skin. But with that bear with an ax walks in the door, and again, for those of you who didn't have me for 430, there's nothing in the world scarier than a bear with an ax because bears scary, ax is scary. Bear with ax is categorically the scariest thing known to mankind, right? Uh, so if that bear with the ax walks in the room, as a result of that, right? If you don't see it, but your loved one does and your loved one suddenly gets very pale in color because they're scared, Right, that is because the constriction of the blood vessels, right, in your skin is making the blood go back to your heart faster. Now, even the bear than axe is even scarier than exams. All right. So, both by getting the blood to come back to the heart faster and by having it relax for a longer period of time, we can get more blood in there. And if we can get more blood in there, we're going to be able to pump more blood out. One of the reasons having more blood in there gets us to able to pump more blood out is what we call the Frank Starling Law. This is one of those, again, fascinating stories. Chainsaw wouldn't work in water. There's nothing scary about a shark with a chainsaw. Exactly, couldn't even start it. Not scary at all, bear with an ass, terrifying. All right, Frank Starling Law. Great, one of those, again, these great stories in anatomy and physiology where you have these two uh, physiologists who were studying something across the pond. One was in England, one was in the United States. Both basically presented papers at a similar time, had a huge, you know, uh, a bare knuckled, bare chested fight over who gets to name it after themselves. And of course, as you can see the results they both got their name on. But what this Frank Starling Law states is that as the ventricle stretches, 
the force it produces uh, is going to be greater as well. Again, think of it in terms of a balloon. If I have a balloon that I just put a little bit of air in and I let it go, it just is going to limply fall to the ground. If I fill that balloon and let it go, it's going to fly around the room. It's going to produce more pressure. Now, of course, the balloon does it with elasticity. So how does this work in the heart muscle? Well, the reason this works in heart muscle is because remember, heart muscle has myofibrils. And myofibrils are, of course, made up of sarcomeres. And in our 430, didn't we learn how the length of a sarcomere affects how much tension it can produce? I will tell you, yes, we did. Remember, the reason for this, as we talked about, and I'll do a real simple basic drawing, is it has all to do with the overlap of myosin and actin. How many myosin heads overlap with the actin determine how powerful our contraction can be, right? Remember, if you stretch the arm all the way out, so that the myosin and the, interact and the actin don't interact at all, how much tension can you produce in your arm then? None, right? Or if we squeeze it too tight so that there's no place for the actin to go, then it's really weak. But remember, if there's plenty of room to be able to pull and also lots of overlap so that lots of myosin and actin can interact, then we produce the most powerful contraction. And remember also in 430, we said when we're in anatomical position, most of our muscles are at their most efficient length. Well, it turns out the heart isn't. The heart at rest normally is a little shorter than its most efficient length would be. So as it stretches, as it fills with blood, it actually stretches to a more optimal, to a stronger length, and it is able to produce a more powerful contraction. Now, if you overfilled it, does that mean it becomes Hulk-like in its strength? No, if you were to artificially overfill it, you could overstretch it and it would get weaker, right? But that would take a lot of artificial hoses and other fun things that would be uh, very dangerous and deadly. But the short-term a point of this is that the overall length of the um, muscle changes. And as it changes, it actually becomes more efficient. So here we got the pretty picture from your textbook. As the uh, muscle stretches, as it fills more, it actually becomes stronger in its contraction. So again, the more blood we get in there, the stronger the contraction and the more blood it will force out. All right. Excellent. So obviously how much blood we can get into the heart is going to affect stroke volume and therefore going to affect um, cardiac output. But Remember also, we talked about how the sympathetic nervous system can increase the contraction of the heart, make the heart actually beat stronger. That has nothing to do with how big the ventricle has gotten. It's about the size of the stimulus. So whether it is an increase in sympathetic or some other type of chemical or hormone or ion changes, these things can make the heart contract stronger. And if we have a stronger contraction, what happens to the amount of blood that gets pumped out? It, it more blood is gonna be pumped out or less blood's gonna be pumped out? More. More. More blood pumped out. More blood is pumped out. We have a larger stroke volume. And if we have a larger stroke volume, our cardiac output increases. So just changing the contraction rate of the heart. 
And again, it doesn't take a bear with an ax to do this. If after class today, because you've been sitting here for three and a half hours, you want to get on the treadmill and start to increase. <laughs> I like your bear with an ax. That's awesome. There you go. That's great. Um, if you... Uh, I didn't think it was that scary when it's a pink bear. Oh, it still is. Oh. You know what? It's in my office at, at school. I, someone actually made me a t-shirt with a bear with an axe on it that I thought was really cool as well. Um, so get the heart to beat stronger from exercising. You can feel the heart beating in your chest because it's beating stronger and your cardiac output has gone up. However, there is also the issue that we have to overcome the pressure in the blood vessels to get the blood out. We call that the afterload, that's the issue. So remember, as we talked about, and I'm gonna clear the drawing so we can go to the next picture. When the ventricle contracts, it is producing pressure inside of the ventricles. And that pressure in here has to become greater than the pressure in the blood vessel. But here's the problem. What if you have hypertension, right? Remember we said the blood pressure, well, actually I don't think we said, we talked about systolic and diastolic pressures, right? Contraction and, and relaxation. We can measure those in the arm. What is a good systolic over diastolic pressures, right? I just had my doctor's appointment just last week because I get them weekly just to make sure. And mine was a good solid four, uh, pardon me, 342 over a 217, which is right about where I like mine to be, right? But again, I'm, some, ever. <laughs> I'm somewhat unique that way. Most people like their systolic and their diastolic to be somewhere within what range? 120 over 80. 120 over 80. Again, mine's a little different because as I mentioned, I have two daughters, right? But, uh, and they're both teenagers, but um, exactly. So we're talking about pressures around from 120 to 80 varying in this. However, if you have hypertension and now suddenly the pressure in here is let's say 160, right? Now the ventricle is having to work a lot harder to produce enough force to get the blood out into the artery. And if it's having to work harder, it's only gonna open that semilunar valve for a shorter period of time. And with each heartbeat, each cardiac cycle, less blood will be pumped out. As a result of that, your stroke volume is going to decrease. As a result of that, your cardiac output is gonna decrease. If we still need to maintain all the oxygen and nutrients to your body, then how are we gonna compensate for that? Heart rate is gonna increase. So now we have a heart working so much harder and so much less efficiently to pump blood where it needs to go. It's having to work harder, it's having to work faster. And when you multiply that times 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years of high blood pressure, that is a tremendous strain that you are putting on the muscles of your heart. It's one of the reasons why they call high blood pressure one of those silent killers, right? Because it is just fatiguing your heart muscle with every single beat. It's working harder and it's working less efficiently. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Here, we did it all with the pretty words, but here's the pretty chart from your textbook that again, just shows the relationship of how for instance, when someone's exercising or when someone's scared or things along those lines, uh, how these influences increase cardiac output, right? You can do it by increasing stroke volume. You can do it by increasing heart rate. 
Uh, you can do it by, again, increasing the amount of blood you get into it, decreasing how much blood is in there afterwards. All of these are things that we, again, all put together into this pretty little flow chart. All right, excellent. That is, of course, the goal to get the heart to pump enough blood to get it where we need it to go. If we can't get enough blood to meet the demands of the body, typically there are several causes to that, but one of them is congestive heart failure. We'll talk about some of the other ones when we get to blood vessels, but I wanna talk about this one because I think this is the one that is least intuitive. Now, as we talked about, the heart is two separate pumps. Obviously they're related to each other, but we have the left side pump and the right side pump. Now, when you start to have congestive heart failure, does it typically occur on both sides at the same time? It's usually one side or the other. Yeah, especially at the beginning, it's typically one side versus the other. So when it occurs, what typically happens is we either get a pulmonary congestion or a peripheral congestion. So let's think about this. Here is our heart. And for simplicity's sake, I'll just put the line down the center. If we have pulmonary, Pulmonary congestion is going to be caused by problems to which side of the heart, the left or the right? Right, right. Side. right, right. side. Right side. Right side, exactly. Because let's think about what would happen. We know that normally both of these have to pump out the same amount of blood. So again, we'll make it easy. This pumps out 100 milliliters of blood, but because this side is damaged, it's only gonna pump about 50 milliliters of blood. Of course, we know blood coming back from the body is going to stay the same to both of them as well. So we now have 100 milliliters coming back to this one, 100 milliliters coming back to this one. But again, this one's only um, pumping out 50. So where are we gonna start getting the congestion? Where are we gonna to start to get the backing up? It'd be in the atrium? Yeah, so it's gonna to start to back up into the atrium. And then from the atrium, where does it start to back up from there? Into the inferior and superior vena cava? Right, which would go out to the systemic arteries. Uh, pardon me, systemic veins we would start to get a backflow and congestion in the systemic veins. Does that sound like pulmonary congestion? No, that sounds a lot more to me like peripheral congestion. Hmm. And indeed it is. Peripheral congestion, you are right in that the right side pumps it to the lungs but that's not where we're getting the congestion. Because of the inefficiency of the right side of the heart, the congestion is actually going up into the systemic veins, right? So this is where we start to get edema, uh, oops, right? We start to get that swelling. We get the swelling of the joints, right? The swelling of the feet at night. all of those type of systemic issues that are occurring because of the failure, the inefficiency, the damage to the right side. So peripheral congestion actually is what occurs from the right side of problems. That means that our pulmonary congestion occurs on the left side from left side issues. So I told you that's why I wanted to go over this because it's not necessarily intuitive. But again, if we were to flip these numbers around, this side is now pumping the normal 100 and this side is just pumping 50. Then what's gonna happen here is we start to get the backflow, the congestion into the atria 
and then that backflow into the lungs. This can lead to problems like breathing difficulty, especially when laying down. Um, problems breathing when laying down. All right. Poor oxygen flow. because of this backing up of it on the left side. So is this considered heart failure, left and right heart failure or heart? So heart yes, so, so it, it, yes. When you have left side heart failure or left side damage, it doesn't have to be complete failure, but yes, left side damage, left side uh, problems, then that is going to lead to a pulmonary congestion. When you have right side heart failure, that is gonna lead to the peripheral congestion, yes. And so again, it's not about where they pump the blood, it's about where the blood backs up into because they're not pumping efficiently. So that's why I said it's not necessarily intuitive when you think about it, but then once you think about it, it should make total sense. All right. What's the actual cause of this? Is just the muscle itself actually weakening? Yeah, it could be muscle weakening. It could be a blockage of a blood vessel. So causing damage to or, or death to the muscle cells. So the muscle cells become less effective. Uh, it could be uh, electrical issues. Uh, scar tissue could be forming that could be disrupting the spread of the electrical activity. There's unfortunately numerous things that could cause this. But usually it has to do with damage to the muscle tissue. Uh, because again, that is what is doing the contraction and that is also what is spreading the, uh, the electrical signal. Of course, when that damage occurs, we can then put in an artificial pacemaker to redirect the electrical signal to try to get the muscles to contract properly. However, if it's large scale muscular a problem, then redirecting the electrical signal is not gonna be sufficient. And what's your choice then? and you need a new heart. Is this something that they say is hereditary potentially, or is that like a factor? The there, are certain, there are certain heart diseases uh, that can have a genetic component. Basically, you can be predisposed. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have it, but you could be predisposed to things like that, yes. Uh, blood, high blood pressure is one of those things as well. So yes, there are some cardiovascular diseases, there are some blood uh, pressure issues that could be genetically uh, predisposed to, yes. Yep. And on that incredible downer, <laughs> we are done with our lecture for today. This is the things that I wanted to talk about. So we are now done with everything you ever wanted to know and more about the heart. So what we will start talking about on, uh, I guess, Tuesday now, because today's, I mean, Monday, because today's Wednesday, right? Today's Wednesday, yes. So on Monday, we will start talking about uh, the rest of the cardiovascular system, primarily focusing on the blood vessels. All right. Questions on any of that? All right. Do now we get... Oh, go ahead. I, I do have a quick question. Yeah. Do we get to have like a like a review before the test? If there is time before, if there's time at the end of uh, Monday's lecture and we have time like this where we finished early, I would happily do a review. Now, the one thing I wanna warn you about my reviews is a review is not me standing here telling you the things that I think are important. That is what I do every day in lecture. A review is where you ask me questions and then we mm -hmm. work together to come out the answer. So if there's something that you're not clear about or not understanding, mm -hmm. uh, that is an opportunity to do that. However, okay. again, uh, we are on schedule. So I anticipate being able to finish early and have some time to do a review. But mm -hmm. remember, you also don't have to wait before two days before the exam to do that. Uh, yeah. I have right after class today, I have office hours. Again, they're not where the five for five is. There's a link yeah. on the homepage. I will be in my office. If there's a concept, if you didn't understand the cardiac cycle, don't wait a week and a half to ask me about it. Come to office hours right after class and ask me about it then. Or if you're studying you know, at two o'clock in the morning tonight and you have a question, send me an email. I'm not gonna respond right back away because I will be asleep. Uh, right. But as soon as I get that email, I will respond to it. So, okay. um, 
so yeah, so absolutely, if there's time, we will have a review, uh, but absolutely don't wait till the review to ask questions if you have them. Got it, thank you. All right, no, thank you. All right, any other questions? Will you post the picture, like the drawings that you did today on the- Yeah, others? I believe I saved two of them. I believe I saved the, the uh, I, I, uh, I think I actually may have saved three. I don't know, uh, hold on, I can tell you exactly what I have. Uh, I took pictures of. Gotta get to the right place. Too many windows. All right, excellent. So let's see. I have the ECG one, which again was pretty simple, but I can still post that. I did the uh, the cardiac cycle one, so I've got my drawing for that. I also uh, took a screenshot of the uh, that pressures when we wrote all the pressures on that. So I have those three things, and I will uh, I will post those three things uh, so that you have access to those. And then, of course, obviously you have access to all of these things uh, through the um, uh, through watching the video again on YouTube as well. All right, excellent. So, any other questions? So again, I don't have any more appointments as far as like the five for five appointments are going. Uh, those times are done. And, however, my office hours are not under the appointment books. I don't like to set appointments for my office hours. I like my office hours to be drop in. So for office hours, there is a link on the main page it, or you can just put in my office phone number here. Let's, uh, let's do that too, just real quickly as a good reminder because we haven't really had formal office hours yet. So this is probably a good time uh, to go over that. Even though they're right after class, I don't do it here in the classroom because uh, as long as this window is opened, uh, it doesn't start compiling the video. Even if I stop recording, it won't compile the video. So I don't like to use this room for that. I want it to be compiling, but what you can do When you go to Canvas, when you go to our site, right here at the beginning is a link that you can click to get to my office. Notice the room number. So if you just want to go to open up Zoom and join a meeting, it's my office phone number. I've made it super simple so it's easy to be able to identify. So you would just join that room and you can put in the phone number without the dashes or you can click this link right from the homepage and that will take you to your office, my office hours. Notice I have office hours right after class today. If you work right after class and those aren't available for you, I also have office hours the hour before my, uh, my 430 class on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Now I know it says 11 to 12, but I will remind you that that class starts at 12. Uh, so like your class, I like to get here 10 minutes early, especially to get everything set up, to get the board set up uh, to, if we're having a daily quiz. So really it's about 11 to 11.50. So don't come scrolling in at 11.49 and think that I'll have five minutes to talk to you because I won't be able to do that. Uh, but you can come in uh, anytime other than that during those. And again, I don't like to do appointments for those uh, because I don't want that pressure for you or for me. I think it's more uh, as you're studying, if you have questions, or like I said, it's perfect because it's right after class. If you have questions, just pop over to there or go get something to eat first, get something to eat and drink, and then come back. I'll be there from uh, 1235 to 135. All right. Excellent. Questions on any of that or anything else? All right. Excellent. Then you guys have an excellent day. Study hard this weekend. And I will see you guys on Monday or in my office hours. Bye. All right. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.